Hey everybody and welcome to True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. This is Katie Weaver and I'm here with my co-host, partner in crime and sister Christy Brower. Hello. Hey everybody. How's it going? Oh, so good. Just going so good. Well, we, good. Uh, we took our camper van to be repaired today. Yeah. Um, it, that, it's only needed fixed for two years. So, you know, not that big of a deal, really. <laughs> it makes a very terrible screeching sound. Yeah. Um, in the front end. That is sort of like, um, it's so, it's not, I don't think it's that serious because I can actually drive the van just fine and the brakes work fine. But something is, you know, amiss. A struts yeah. or something. Yeah. Uh, but the sound is so bad that Rhonda has vowed she will never ride in it again until we get it fixed because it is terrifying to her. And I try to tell her, like, I'm, it's fine. Like, everything, the steering works, the brakes work, whatever it is, it's something. But, you know, it yeah. scares the hell out of her. So today we took it to the van guy to get fixed. So well, good. I don't know what's wrong with it yet. But, you know, that way then we can soon be camping. So that's good. Well, good. The van doctor will fix it up. He will. Yes, I'm, I have no doubt. Very good. Well, good. Well, all's well here. We've been, I serve on the board of our local uh, girls softball association. So, you know, my, my daughter, of course, is a, is a varsity player, but I serve on the board of the little girls, you know, for the like the T-ball, the 6U and 8U, 10U, and 12U, and 14U teams, and mm -hmm. it is time for our season to start. So our, our first game start in two weeks, so we are really, you know, doing all the stuff, wrapping up the, the loose ends to be ready to go. It's very exciting. So That's fun. We just made it through registration, and we have more girls than registered last year, so that's always the hope, and oh, we met today to go through all of the equipment and build coaches bags for all the teams and oh my god looking at the itty bitty catcher's gear and the little teeny bats <laughs> for the little tiny like six-year-old teams oh my god oh, you guys. cute it absolutely melts my heart it is such a cute it's so sweet oh yeah, yeah. and i just i love softball you know and i love the girls yeah. softball softball turns girls into fierce badass girls it you does. know it really does and so it's just fun. It's exciting. It's exciting to see our season coming together and to get more girls than we've had in the past. And yeah, I'm just excited. I think this is going to be my last year because, uh, you know, my kid's graduating. I don't really <laughs> right. need to. And, and hopefully she'll be at a school next year and I'll be wanting to take off and go to her games and not be tied down to this committee. But anyway, I've enjoyed it. And it's just really fun to be a part of growing, yeah, growing the community in this way. So, yeah. So fun today to go through all the stuff and start like it's getting really real. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I love it. Well, I have a case today for Christy. I'm gonna present a case. She's gonna cold read it for us. I told her it was an effort of a case, and it truly is. You did. I know. I've been like, well, great. Does that mean I'm gonna like it or hate it? Or I don't know what that means. You're gonna hate it. Oh, great. And like it. Oh. <laughs> as as you do with true crime, right? I'll and ask you later. Yeah, if you hate and like this case, because I know you will. All right. So this is the case of a vanishing priest. Oh. This happened in Montana in a little tiny town called Ronan, Montana. Christy, you're going to know exactly where this is. Okay. Ronan is 30 miles outside of Polson, Montana. Okay. Polson, Montana is on the shores of Flathead Lake. Oh, okay. We've been there. Yes, we have. And we were there because, and so this is a place that's right outside of Missoula, not too mm -hmm. far from Missoula. There is a wonderful, wonderful place right there, uh, right outside of Polson called the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas. Yeah. And the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas is such a beautiful place. It was conceptualized by a Rinpoche who had been in prison in Tibet and kept dreaming about being in the United States in this valley that was shaped like a lotus. And mm -hmm. he was told in his dreams that if you build this garden with a thousand Buddhas in it, 
that every time the wind blows, it will blow peace across America. And so much later in life, he was in the U.S. and one of his students was driving him through Montana. And lo and behold, they drove through this valley that's shaped like a lotus. And he said, this is it. This is where the garden is supposed to be built. We have to buy this land. And it wasn't for sale. In fact, it is bordering and maybe actually on the Indian reservation right there. And it took a lot of work to be able to buy the land. But she made it happen. His student uh, was a wealthy woman that had some connections and was able to make it happen. And then they spent the next 10 years building the garden. And a dear friend of ours was uh, very involved in it. And in fact, so they had, um, there's this enormous green Tara in the middle of the garden. So amazing. And then there's all of these like little walls. It's kind of like spokes around her, almost like spokes on a wheel. And Mm -hmm. on the walls, there's a Buddha and then there's a stupa and a Buddha and a stupa. And they had set up this uh, shack where you could actually go and help pour the Buddhas. They poured a thousand Buddhas out of cement yeah. and they poured a thousand stupas. So the stupas are like these little, kind of like a little building, wouldn't you say? That's kind of what they look like. Mm-hmm. And you could sponsor a stupa and put things in it. So like maybe you, it was a memorial for someone or anyway, this dear friend of ours uh, purchased a stupa in our name when we had healing hands and we placed a bunch of, uh, you know, crystals and herbs and, you know, important things to us in the stupa. And that's there in our, in our name, which I just think is really special. So several years ago, we went there the second September of Saturday every year, or the, the second weekend of September, <laughs> they have the, the second September, second September of, Saturday. of Saturday. Yeah, I heard oh, it. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> the second weekend of every September. Is that better? Does that seem right? Good yeah, it does. Anyway, <laughs> it, the it second is Saturday world. in September. Yep, there you go. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> they have World Peace Day. And they have a big event up there. They didn't have it this last year because of COVID, but I'm hoping it'll be back this year. Mm -hmm. But there's vendors and they're singing and dancing and there are the Rinpoche's there that uh, spearheaded this project. The Dalai Lama has been there before. There's just all kinds of wonderful Mm -hmm. things that happen. So anyway, we went several years ago and spent the weekend up there and it was just such a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. But so that's why we've even been to this area but you're going to recognize i think um what i'm talking about here at these areas oh yeah for sure yeah so ronan ronan is where the church that this uh pastor was assigned to ronan Mm -hmm. is about 11 miles outside of polson okay so he was had just been transferred from another church that was about 30 miles away. And he came into town on July 20th, 1984. His name was John Patrick Kerrigan. So Father Kerrigan. He walked into a place called Denault's Bakery in Ronan. And Ronan is a teeny tiny town, a teeny tiny Montana town. Mm -hmm. And it was a Friday evening. And this is a up in the Mission Mountains, and even in the summertime, it's kind of chilly. So he walks into town. Uh, This is his 13th assignment, his 13th church since he started ministering uh, 30 years earlier. So he started ministering in 1954 Mm. in Montana. And he had been, this was the 13th uh, assignment to one of his little country uh, missions Mm. in 30 years. So the next day, he was supposed to deliver his first sermon as the permanent pastor at the Sacred Heart Parish. It was right across the street from the bakery. So he wandered into the bakery and started meeting people. It was late in the evening. It was 11 p.m. So he was shaking hands with people and introducing himself and, you know, visiting with people and just kind of getting to know the locals. 
Yeah. And people were chatting with him and just, you know, kind of getting to know him. So he told them that he was, uh, you know, he was going to go to a wedding in Plains. So Plains was where he came from. So a parish in Plains, Montana, which again was about 30 miles away. Mm -hmm. So he was planning on going back to Plains for a funeral and a wedding and then coming back to his parish for his very first uh, sermon. Okay. So the next day at 5.30 p.m., his uh, parishioners gathered, about 100 people, for the 5.30 mass, and he didn't show up, and nobody had heard from him, and his car was not at the rectory. Mm. So we're showing a picture of what the church, so you have the church there on the right and on the left is this little red brick house. That's the rectory. That was his new home. Okay. And he was driving a big old green Impala, big boxy green Impala. Okay. And, you know, a car that when he came into town, everyone knew who, you know, that was the pastor or the reverend that was, or the father. Sure, it probably him. would have stood out. Yeah, for sure. In a little town like that. Yeah. So his car wasn't at the rectory. No one had seen him all day. And... He didn't show up to church, which was just really weird. So they called the Helena diocese and, you know, out of concern because where in the world was he? Right. And they had no idea. They hadn't heard from him. Okay. Sunday morning mass, everybody shows up, but Father Kerrigan does not. So at this point, there's some serious concern about where in the hell is he? This is totally unlike him. Right. Like he's I mean, never just not showed up. Yeah. Right. He's a priest. I mean, this is what they do. I mean, where else yeah. would he be? Yeah. So the diocese in Helena, they're like the boss hogs, you know, they, right. call, they call the police and say that they think that uh, maybe we have a missing person. Something mm -hmm. has happened. He's not, and he also, it doesn't sound like he actually ever showed up to Plains to the places he was supposed to be there either. Okay. So I was, was wondering just, that because he was going to a wedding, right? And mm -hmm. he, he never came to the wedding. Gotcha. Yeah. He was just mm -hmm. missing. So on Monday, July 3rd, a woman uh, outside of Ronan was setting up a uh, right outside of Polson, between Polson and Ronan, she was setting up a roadside fruit stand. And as she's setting up her stuff, she realizes there is something stacked along the side of the road that she that shouldn't be there. And mm. she goes and checks it out, and it is a neatly stacked pile of bloody clothes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And they're his clothes and his glasses. Now, there's one inconsistency in the two police reports. One of the police reports says that his wallet was there. Mm -hmm. That his wallet is uh, there, his shirt, shoes, a windbreaker that uh, people who knew him identified as his. There was a $100 bill in one of the shirt pockets. And the police report says his wallet containing about $200. And that's how they knew that this was his stuff. So I'll tell you about the inconsistency in a minute. But at any rate, uh, the crime lab reports do match the hair up on these things to hair that they found in a brush from his home. And they do believe these are he, his clothes. Mm -hmm. Near all of this bloody stuff is a deformed bloody coat hanger. Mm like a, a metal coat hanger that looks like it's been stretched out to uh, maybe commit a crime. So okay. that's all they find for a week. And a week later, finally, uh, his Chevy Impala is found on a hill outside of Polson. Uh, just not a lot of miles, about five miles away from the rectory, but a ways out of town. And about okay. three miles away from where his bloody clothes were found. So it's at the base of the radio towers up in Polson, kind of up, you know, heading up the, the hill. So 
the Impala has been completely wiped clean of fingerprints. His fingerprints aren't inside, nor are anybody else's. However, on the passenger side, there is a bunch of blood. There's blood all over that passenger side door and the side, passenger side floorboard. In the trunk, police find a red drenched pillow, a bloody pillow and a bloody shovel and Kerrigan's wallet. So we have that weird inconsistency there. Mm -hmm. And in this report, they say Kerrigan's wallet has more than $1,000 in cash. Mm. So we're not sure which place the wallet Odd was actually found. For a priest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's the one inconsistency. Uh, apparently, there were quite a few inconsistencies. Uh, but again, you have to remember, I mean, these are tiny towns that don't handle a lot of murder, right. you know? No, not at all. And so at any rate, uh, so, so that's what happens. So the whole Mission Valley is pretty shaken up over all of this, you know, because, yeah, because, you know, the new father comes into town and is immediately maybe murdered. <clears throat> the keys to his car are found in the weeds about 30 yards away. Like somebody threw them. So one of the things that had happened, it, his murder wasn't the only thing that happened that week that had everybody really shaken up. Mm. There had also been four inmates that fled from a state-owned vehicle out of a maximum security prison unit. So like a work camp group. Okay. From the Montana State Prison. Mm -hmm. It was a youth camp group. They fled about 50 miles northeast and so they were youth they were minors they were youth but they were older minors they were like okay. 18 year olds okay and two of them kidnapped and raped a woman in avaro and so and were at large at this time and so people were really really freaked out yeah understandably so but also Poor Polson, uh, these poor police were totally overwhelmed because also in an unrelated incident in Polson on January 22nd, so two days before the priest disappeared or, or the day before he disappeared, uh, an 18-year-old kid named Reed Nevins murdered a 41-year-old woman in her home in Polson. Oh, my gosh. So the police wow. are totally overwhelmed. And oh. you've got these, you know, criminals on the run as well, somewhere in the valley that have committed some crimes. Yeah. So they don't know, you know, who, like, is it the inmates that got away? Did they do something to the father? Like, what the hell has happened? Well, within two weeks, they have caught all four of the con the, the convicts. Mm -hmm. And they, they eliminate them as yeah, no. the suspects they didn't No, this was run. intentional this was targeted this wasn't a this wasn't just a, a happenstance this was definitely somebody who had a vendetta okay so there was also at the time there had been rumors of a serial killer of priests because there were actually a few other priests that had been murdered. One in Townsend, a man named Reverend James Otis Anderson had also died. However, his death looked like maybe it could have been a suicide, mm -hmm. but he died. He was friends with Father Kerrigan and he died under some strange uh, you know, circumstances two years before. Mm -hmm. Also in New Mexico at very close to the same time that Father Kerrigan disappeared, there was another priest that was murdered. So some people thought that there must have been a serial killer that was uh, targeting priests. There wasn't a lot, or, or clergy, but there wasn't a lot of... Uh, proof there's not a lot of proof it was kind of it was a theory that people were kicking around mm -hmm. so the police you know they have a lot of dna evidence but they don't have a lot of tech for that 
but they do have this investigation. But within a couple of months, they really have nothing to go on. Did they confirm that the blood was Kerrigan's in the car? I believe they did. It was his blood type, at least. Yes. Okay. I, mean, I guess this is the 80s. I'm thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. They believe that it was. Okay. Yeah. And again, they had found hair in both the car and on the clothes that they matched to his hair. It was his. Okay. Yep. So nothing happens for quite a while. I mean, the police are trying to figure out what has happened, but some kind of troubling things start coming up. So, I mean, at first they just learned some pretty basic stuff. He was born on January 10th, 1926 in Butte. He attended St. Joseph grade school in Central High School. I say before you say it, that he was yeah. pretty problematic as a priest. That he got moved around a lot because he there were problems with him. And I know you're going to say that. Mm -hmm. I want to say it first because yes. I'm the psychic reading this case. Yes. I feel like he was moved a lot and moved to these little towns because he was a problem. Do you want to say why? Um, it's not cliche. Um, Go ahead and say it. He was, uh, you know, he liked little kids. I think he liked boys. That was my sense right away. And I should have just said it at the very beginning, but yeah, mm -hmm. I do feel that. I also feel there's something about money with him. Ah, interesting. But, but okay. definitely he was one of those, one of those bad guy priests who liked to touch kids. I, okay. he's had 13 placements in 30 years. That's yeah. not very common. And I no. just get the impression from him that he, yeah, he's not your average priest, I guess is what I'm saying. He's not. Um, and, and I'm going to give you a lot more information on that. But one thing I found interesting is that one of the people that knows him told the police that he liked to cowboy up and dress in cowboy clothes and go and uh, borrow horses and or, or ride people's horses and also help uh, with branding season. Mm. He liked to go help run cows and run cattle. And, and he was raised and in stuff. Butte. I mean, can yeah. you imagine that was what he grew up with? Mm -hmm. But but they thought it was kind of remarkable that a, a priest would, you know, don his I mean, uh, Wranglers just... and boots and be out there <laughs> taking care of cows and stuff. I mean, it's what he knew. It doesn't surprise yeah. me. I think so. So... He went to Seattle where he attended St. Edward's Seminary. He was ordained in Butte and began to work in the ministry in Butte in St. Patrick's Church in 1954. So again, as we know, he was uh, moved around a lot. Uh, Father James Gannon from Stevensville had told the AP that uh, he was very outgoing and friendly and he had a lot of friends. He was made friends with a lot of the other priests across the state. There was a lot of other fathers that, you know, kind of congregated together and he uh, had a lot of friends that way. So it starts to bother the detectives that he has <coughs> shuttled around so much. Mm -hmm. So he's been from Hamilton, then back to Butte, then to Dillon, then back to Butte, then to Browning, to Bozeman, to Drummond, to White Sulphur Springs, to Chateau, and eventually to Plains. And then, of course, here he was in, you know, 1984, headed to oh, no. Olson. Right, yeah. No. And it's, it's just, well, and I mean, they, this is Montana. I mean, how many parishes are there? Like, that might be all of them. Right, <laughs> right. You know, or close to all of them. Like, mm -hmm. they're... so then they discover something else that is really problematic. There was a time where Kerrigan was not at any church for a while. He was at a place in New Mexico called the Congregation of the Servants of the Paraclete in Hemis Springs, New Mexico. Hmm. Well, a peek into this place, it's also known as Camp Pede. Oh, God, of course it is. Gross. This is a rehabilitation center that is owned by the Catholic Church. For It was initially started for priests that were suffering from mental health issues, addiction, or alcoholism. Mm -hmm. But it pretty quickly became, and, and it was started sometime in the 
late 40s, early 50s. It quickly became a stopping point for a priest who had been accused of pedophilia. Mm. And actually, I didn't even know that existed. But mm, then again, I'm not a Catholic. It's had a lot of stopping points. Uh, a lot of people that were there. Yeah. So they were bringing all of these priests here to give them therapy for pedophilia. You know, rather than turn them over to the police. Yeah. This is what they were doing instead. They to jail and sex offender. Mm -hmm which is what you actually do. Mm -hmm. Not, that, you know, there really is no fun. There, there is no therapy, really. I mean, there are things that people no. try, but there's nothing successful. The, exactly. So there was a, a study that was done there. They had actually had brought some psychiatrists and some psychologists in to work with these priests who eventually, you know, released to the church a uh, like 92 page document basically laying out the recidivism rates and basically saying this isn't doing anything if you have priests or nuns because there was a, nuns were coming here too mm -hmm. if you have priests or nuns that are touching children they're not going to stop you have to stop putting them in parishes right but they didn't do that no, of course they didn't. Jeez, this was the 80s. I mean, this this mm -hmm. is still going on now yeah. in yeah. 2021. That's so crazy. Wow. Yeah. So one thing that they would do while they were there is that this was a stopping point. So you might live here and do therapy and stuff for a few months. But if there was any uh, parish anywhere that needed a minister for a little while, they'd send you there for a bit. So all they were doing was just turning them over to greener pastures yeah. over and over and over again. So I'm we don't know how many times he ended up here, but we know that he was here at some point. Mm -hmm. Really interesting that I, uh, there was a report that came out in 2015, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Helena posted the names of 80 former employees, mostly priests and nuns, who had allegedly sexually abused children in Western Montana. And that most of them, particularly the priests and, and some of the nuns, had had stays at the, uh, the Paraclete mission. Mm. So this was a really pretty well-known thing. In fact, there was a man there named Father Michael Baker, who in California molested so many freaking kids that he finally got busted and went to prison for three years. When he was released... For three years? Mm-hmm. Three years. You'd when think he was that released, was an Idaho sentence for some yeah, who molested kids. You'd think so. When he was released, they just uh, sent him right on off to Hemis Springs, to the uh, servants of the Paraclete, and rehabilitated him and put him right back in the priesthood, where he just no. kept on we doing it. Such thing. Right, right, because there is yeah. no rehabilitation. It doesn't exist. So the police started to wonder if it was possible that this was some kind of... Uh, you know, that this was someone who had uh, has had anything to do with his past behavior. Right. And very quickly dismissed that idea altogether. That now we don't. Why? They, they won't release any reasons why. So, because they don't have any. That's right. why. Because yeah. they don't have any. Yeah, they don't. They don't want to suspect anyone in their community. Mm -hmm. So there's really nothing. Like, this actually uh, aired on Unsolved Mysteries in 1988, this story did. Wow. But at any rate, there really nothing came of it. All it was just one dead end after another. His body has never been found. There is no follow-up whatsoever. That was it. That the case went completely cold right there. Now, strangely, about 12 years later, a new sheriff took over and he made an announcement 
that they were, they had a suspect and they were just about ready to make an arrest and they were going to put this thing to bed. And then nothing. And then nothing. They never spoke of it again. There was never an arrest. There was never a discussion. Nothing. It was just done. And that's it. So the Associated Press interviewed the old sheriff who had already uh, retired not too long ago, just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And he said that they have evidence. They just couldn't ever completely put somebody away for it. And they just didn't have enough to wrap it up. And so he was really pushed with, you know, well, what could it be? I mean, it wasn't a robbery. All the cash was there. You know, his car was there. It doesn't look like they took anything from him. And all he would say is, I wouldn't want to talk about that. I don't want to mess it up for somebody else to solve. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where it sits. At any rate, that that's the whole case. So I want to validate for you uh, that you're absolutely correct. He was a very problematic priest. And clearly, as we know, by his time in the uh, mission of the paracletes that, uh, you know, he was, they had tried to rehabilitate this fool and instead were just sending him all over the Mission Valley and all over Montana, letting him molest kids. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Christy, I'd like you to just give us a full uh, reading of who you think did this, where you think his body is, you know, all, all that jazz. So we'll, we'll take a break now. Hi, I'm Christy Brower, podcaster and professional psychic. I have spent the last 14 years honing my skills as a psychic and a healer. I work on the Purple Ocean app. You can find it in any of the app stores. And I am available every day for video and chat readings. I specialize in pattern breaking, uh, particularly in relationships, but really in any area of your life. If you're feeling stuck and like you can't move on or you can't let something go, I am the reader for you. That is exactly what I focus on. It's what I love to do. I love to help stuck people get moving and I've been doing it for many years and have been very successful at it and can do that for you as well. So if you are having trouble letting go of a relationship or a fear or a challenge of any kind in your life, come see me at Purple Ocean and we will do everything we can, me and my guidance system and my intuition and you, because it's always a package deal that we work together, but we will find a way to break that pattern for you. So come see me over at Purple Ocean and let's break your patterns. All righty. Well, we are back. Of course, this is True Crime Paranormal with the Psychic Sisters. And today we are talking about the vanishing of Father John Kerrigan in Montana. So uh, I have presented the case and Christy is now going to Go ahead and give us her psychic sense on what she thinks happened here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he, this has felt like revenge from the very beginning to me, uh, some kind of retribution. I do feel that when he showed up in Ronan, that there was a community member who recognized him from a previous life experience, a, a, a man who had been, been molested by him in another parish when he was a child. I do feel that that person had a really strong anger response to seeing him. There was a confrontation. I feel that the day that he was supposed to be going to the wedding, there was some kind of confrontation between him and this other person. And they got into the car to drive because the, the priest wanted to talk, try to talk it through, basically. And uh, the other person had such a strong reaction to seeing him after all these years and after what he'd done to him that he killed him. Uh, I believe his body's in Flathead Lake. I do. I, I feel like he weighted him down and put him in the, in the lake. I kind of doubt they even looked for him in there, to be perfectly honest. I don't feel like they did a lot of looking at all, but I do feel he was in the lake. I mean, I don't think there's much to find now. But I do feel... That he's there. I feel that this person is not a bad person. And this that's a hard thing to say because you murdered a priest. But it had such a strong trauma response. Sometimes when people 
are confronted with the perpetrator of childhood trauma, they have a psychotic episode. And I feel like that's what happened here. I also feel like the folding up and stacking up of the clothes was a, there was some remorse here because this person, you know, sort of did something way out of character that no one would ever believe them to do that they couldn't even believe that they did themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it all kind of doesn't make much sense because it didn't make any sense. I do feel that this was some kind of a break. If they were to look into people in their community, somebody that had a pretty significant mental health break at this time, I think they would probably find, you know, and maybe they already know that, but I feel like they would find some evidence there. Mm -hmm. But I do feel that this person did conceal the body. And I, I do feel like they, they weighted it down and put it in Flathead Lake and wiped down the car and left covered their tracks yeah okay i also feel honestly that law enforcement knows way more than they're saying and this is a person who's well known in their community and respected and loved and that they felt very uh torn knowing the history and the situation here and that really in a lot of ways there was a cover-up of protecting that person Mm -hmm. You know, and there there have been cases like this where something yeah. just like this has occurred, you know, where, you know, the there's a sort of a diminished capacity defense for someone in that situation mm -hmm. that they may actually not even be charged or, you know, meet with a light sentence. And I feel yeah. like I feel like this could have been that situation, but I don't feel like anybody's ever going to tell now. Uh -huh. I feel like it's been way too long. Yeah. Nobody's ever going to tell the truth of this story now. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So I figured you were going to say Flathead Lake. That's how, that was exactly what I thought as well. Yeah. And so um, when I was researching this case, I was.